Hi, for this video what I want to do is I want to show you how to do a two sample t-test uh, when you're testing the difference between means. And for this particular one, I do want to show you what to do when you have to pool the data. Okay, so a couple things. In order to run the two sample t-test, you do have to have random samples. Um, you will have to have samples that are independent of each other. And either both of your samples have to be greater than or equal to 30 or both of your populations have to be normally distributed. So um, this is the sample size condition. It either have to both be greater than or equal to 30, and it will work for any distribution. Um, if you have smaller sample sizes, then the population does have to be normally distributed. And for this, both sigma 1 and sigma 2 are unknown. That means that you do not know that the population, so sigma 1 and sigma 2 are the population variances. In this case, you know the sample standard deviations. Okay, so you use T whenever you know the sample standard deviations, and you would use Z if you know the population standard deviations. Okay, so this is the rule and how you decide if you are going to pool. You are going to pool only if the population variances are known to be equal. So it may either say in word form the population variances are known to be equal, or it may say it symbolically that sigma 1 equals sigma 2. So if sigma 1 equals sigma 2 is um, stated in the problem, then you know that the population variances are equal. It's always safer to not pool. So if you don't know if the variances are equal, then you would select don't pool. But if you are in a stats class, as I assume you are since you're watching this video, um, you would look to see does it say population variances are equal or does it say sigma 1 and sigma 2 are equal. Another thing that I do want to point out about the conditions really quickly uh, before I forget is sometimes in different textbooks the conditions are slightly different, so make sure that you do check with your text that you are using for your course. Uh, the text that I'm currently teaching from, these are the conditions that they require, but I know that different textbooks do have different conditions listed, so make sure that you have everything that's required for your course. Okay, and the only way that your professor or your teacher can understand if you are checking the conditions is if you actually write them down. I know it gets time consuming and sometimes we don't want to do that, um, but it is an important part of the process. All right, the degrees of freedom when you are pooling is equal to N1 plus N2 minus 2. Um, if you're not pooling, the degrees of freedom are different. So I do have a video that shows how to do it when you are not pooling. Okay, and then to find the standardized test statistic, this is the one formula that I do not require my students to show the work on. Um, but if you are required to show the work, this is the formula that you would use. Again, check your textbook um, because of the fact that it is, it could be different. Um, I know that the denominator can be found in different ways that I've seen it differently in different textbooks, but let me just kind of explain this. To find the standardized test statistic T, um, to determine whether or not your values are um, unusual or not, you would do your sample mean of your first, whatever you set, set up as your first um, sample, minus the sample mean um, for your second sample. And it's really important to know that X bar one goes with whatever you put in the, um, the null in the alternative hypothesis as your population mean. So whatever one you are establishing to be one in your null hypothesis, you have to make sure that the sample mean goes first in the formula. Okay, for the most part, this part right here in your um, question will be mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. This would be that there is no difference. If they said that there's a difference that's greater than or equal to one or something like that, that's the only time that this will change. But for the most part in a basic stats class or a starting stats class, you will have that there is no difference and that's what you're starting with. So if you're starting with that they are equal to each other in the null hypothesis, then you would plug in zero for the mu1 minus mu2. Okay, um, N1 represents the sample size of your first whatever you establish to be one, and N2 represents whatever you establish to be 
um, the sample size of your group two. S1 is the sample standard deviation of your first group and S2 is the um, sample standard deviation. Like I said, for this video, I'm just going to show you how to get T in the calculator. I'm not going to show the work. I will do another video that uses the rejection region decision rule, and I will show how to plug all the values in here in case you do have to show the work, um, but you would just plug all your values into the corresponding place in this formula. It is something that you have to pay a lot of attention to, especially if you're doing this by hand. So I want to just show you how to do it in the um, calculator. And like I said, for my students, I do not require the work for this particular one. Okay, so a manufacturer claims that the mean cost to operate its car is less than that of its main competitor. You want to test the manufacturer's claim. You randomly sample 35 cars from the manufacturer and 33 cars from the main competitor. The sample statistics are shown in this table down here. And we want to look at alpha equals 0 0.05. Do we have enough evidence to support the manufacturer's claim? Um, assume the population variances are equal. So notice it does tell us that the population variances are equal. And since this statement is here, remember that that is what I'm looking for to decide if I should pool or not. Okay, if it says the population variances are not equal, then you don't pool. So that's the difference between pooling and not pooling. Um, you will just select it in your calculator. All right, so let's look at our conditions. Remember that the first one that we're looking for is that we have to have random samples. So it does say that we randomly sampled. The cars for the manufacturer and the competitor would be independent. Okay, um, you know that they are different of each other. One does not influence the other one. Okay, um, we do need to, or we do know that sigma one and sigma two are unknown. Okay. And it doesn't matter what order you put them in as long as you check all of the conditions. And then the last one is our sample size. So if we look at our sample size in one and in two, so in one equals 35 and in two equals 33, both of which are greater than or equal to 30. So we can continue. So we can use a T or a two sample t test and our degrees of freedom we are going to remember do in one plus in two minus two so that is our formula in order to find the degrees of freedom so we would plug in 35 plus 33 minus two and so when you do that, you get 68 minus 2 gives us 66. Okay, um, so that is our information. And like I said, I am going to just use the calculator to help us find the information. Okay, so the first thing that we want to do is set up our null and our alternative hypothesis. We always write the null hypothesis first. Okay, and different textbooks have different ways of writing this. Sometimes they require that you write it in word form. So um, if you are required to write it in word form, you would just go through and say um, the mean cost of the manufacturer is less than. And since this is an inequality statement, that means it has to go in the alternative hypothesis. That's how you decide whether your claim goes in the alternative or whether it goes in the null hypothesis. So our claim would go here. And so we would just say that the mean of the first, and I'm gonna establish that the manufacturer is group one and the competitor is group two. If you notice that this one has a one underneath it and this one has a two, if they didn't have a table set up and they just said that the manufacturer's mean, then you would have to just establish which one is one and which one is two. Okay, so we're gonna say the population mean of the first one is less than the population mean of the second. So um, 
If you wanted to write this in word form, you could say the mean of the manufacturer is less than the mean of the competitor. So sometimes instead of using one and two, it's easier to actually use the word form. You could even put mu sub manufacturers less than mu sub competitor to keep track of it. That's always possible. And the null hypothesis would just be the complement of that. So we would say that mu one is greater than or equal to mu two. Okay, um, some texts will write this instead of this way. Um, they will just use the equal sign. The text that I currently teach from doesn't allow this, um, but it is accepted in other textbooks. That's the hardest part of my job as a stats teacher is that there are so many different interpretations in different books. It's really kind of the same thing. It's just that different authors have different interpretations. Probably they were taught differently. Um, so it is okay to put it this way. Another way that you could say this is because we're testing the difference is we could say that mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. And so that's why in that formula part, um, you would plug in the zero for the mu1 minus mu2 because we're really saying that there is no difference, that they're equal to each other. So that's what we're starting with. Um, we always start assuming that the null hypothesis is true, so there really is no difference. We're looking at the evidence to see if it's strong enough, okay? Um, so I am going to now grab my calculator and we're going to find the test statistic. Remember that it is important always to draw a model. On this one, because it is a left tail test, we will shade and remember that the tail of the test always depends on the alternative. So if it's pointing to the left, it's a left tail. If it's not equal to, it's a two tail. And then if it's greater, it's going to be a right tail. So um, always look at the alternative to determine the tail of the test. Okay, and like I said, I'm not showing the work on this one to find T, but we're gonna use our calculator to find T. And then we're also going to find our p-value in our calculator to help us make our decision. Okay, so with this, what we would do is you're going to go to stat and tests, and you're going to choose the two sample t-tests. So we're going to go through, we're going to find the two sample t-tests. Um, you would use data if you have all of the data to plug into L1 and L2. On this one, we don't have the data, so I would go to stats and hit enter. And then we're just going to get the information from our chart. So we're going to use this information here in the chart to plug in for our corresponding values. It's very important that you plug the correct values in for X bar 1 and X bar 2, because if you don't, it will give you the wrong answer. Okay. Um, so for X bar 1, we had 0.53, that it's 53 cents per mile. Um, for S, it's 0.06. Our sample size of our first is 35. X bar two was 56. And again, I'm just, I have the chart written down on a piece of paper, so I'm just plugging in the values. And then our sample size is 33. Um, for this part here, remember that you want it to match the alternative hypothesis. So since we had less than in the alternative hypothesis, that's the one that we would pick. Um, for pooled, this is where we looked again we already decided that yes we do want to pool because the populations um, the population variances are stated to be equal i'm just going to do it in blue and i'm going to hit draw instead of calculate the reason i hit draw is so i can see what the model looks like and it makes it easier to put onto paper if you wanted to you could just hit calculate and it will give you the information as well and I should have checked to make sure that I didn't have something else turned on. So if you notice these dots on here, that means that I was graphing something earlier on my calculator and I have my scatter plot turned on. So if you want to get rid of that, you can just go to second y equals and we can see that my plot one is turned on and I'm going to turn that off. Okay, unfortunately, I do have to go back and rerun it again, um, but it will have saved all of my information so I don't have to retype it in. And I could have just ignored it, but just so if you do run into that, um, you could also get an error here. If you do, just check your Y equals screen or check the second stat plot to make sure that you don't have anything turned on because if you do, sometimes it can cause problems if it doesn't work. 
Okay, so down at the bottom here, you can see that um, the T is negative 1.901 and the P value is approximately 0 0.0308. Okay, so I'm going to write those down. T is approximately negative 1.901. And our p-value, remember that our p-value is the probability that we got this. Okay, so this is the probability that our t-value is less than negative 1.901. Okay, and that is equal to or approximately 0 0.0308. So when you draw your model, you would shade about 3% of the area. So this is going to be my p-value which is, remember, just the area, 0 0.0308, and it starts at t is negative 1.901. Okay, remember to make your decision, you are going to look at um, the p-value and compare it to alpha. So our p-value is 0 0.0308, and we are going to compare that to our alpha, which was 0.05. And since this is less, anytime the p-value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. Okay, if the p-value was greater than alpha, then we would fail to reject. So we would make the decision to reject the null hypothesis. And then our last step is just to write a sentence explaining our findings in the context of the original claim. So we can say at 5%, so whatever level of confidence, it's important to put that in there, we have enough evidence. So now if we go back to what we had, um, remember that anytime you reject, you're going to say we have enough evidence. Um, so we have enough evidence to support our claim because we're rejecting this part here. We're rejecting this. And since we're rejecting that, it points to our alternative hypothesis being true. And since our claim was about the alternative hypothesis, we have enough evidence to support the claim that the cost to operate the manufacturer's car is less than that of the main competitor. So it's really important to make sure that you use the correct word right here. Um, so the text that I use is if um, the claim is about the alternative, then you always use the word support. If the claim was about the null hypothesis, then you would use the word reject. Okay, um, and it's really important to have the context so that anybody can understand. So for this, I know it is a lengthy process. It's even longer if you have to show the workout and plug in all the values in for T. Um, like I said, this is the only one that I don't require my students to show the work for finding the standardized test statistic T, uh, just because of the fact that the formula is so cumbersome. As always, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know. If there are additional topics that you would like me to cover, please let me know that as well.